Okay, uh, I would like to, to introduce in this uh, clinical seminar uh, my uh, research fellow, Ms. Kondogiani Evangelia. Uh, Kondogiani Evangelia is a psychologist that uh, is working with us in our psychogeriatric unit, Memory Clinic, and uh, she's going to present uh, the research uh, view on um, the, the presence of neuropsychiatric symptoms in, in patients with uh, neurocognitive uh, disorders. Ms. Kodoyani, please. Thank you. So, thank you, Professor, and I would also like to thank the Hellenic Initiative Against Alzheimer's Disease for the invitation. Um, in today's topic, we will be re referring to sensory and cognitive impairment, and we will also mention a European research program entitled SenseCog, that investigates the interlink between these impairments and we will have the chance to present some preliminary data on uh, the impact of sensory deficits on neuropsychiatric symptoms in people with dementia from a Greek sample. Uh, this is an overview of today's presentation. We will go through epidemiology, um, some facts about sensory impairment and cognitive decline. Uh, we will talk about the SenseCog project and then about the study, aims, methods, results and conclusions. To begin with, uh, mental, cognitive, vision and hearing health problems are considered to be among the 10 public health challenges, the top 10 public health challenges in Europe for elderly population, leading to reduced quality of life and increased healthcare utilization. Uh, the prevalence of chronic diseases, including dementia and sensory impairment, seems to be increased as population is aging, uh, whereas age-acquired sensory impairment, both hearing or vision impairment, seem to affect almost one in three Europeans, leading to poorer mental health impacting their quality of life and increasing their disability. To be more specific about its impairment, uh, when it comes to cognitive impairment and dementia, in 2015, uh, it was estimated that over 46.8 million of people aged 60 years and older uh, were living with dementia, and this number is estimated to rise to 72 million by 2050 leading to increased disability adjusting life years and increased health costs. When it comes to sensory impairments, um, it is estimated that over the age of 65, about one third of people are affected by disabling hearing loss and seven in 10 suffer, suffer either sight or hearing loss or dual sensory impairment. When it comes to population living with dementia, um, the range varies. Uh, in a community memory clinic, in a study, over 70% of uh, respondents reported that they required support for hearing loss. Despite the high rates of prevalence, uh, it is also evidence, there is also evidence that when sensory and cognitive impairment um, are present, uh, they lead to greater difficulties in several aspects of the lives of people living with dementia. Uh, people with comorbid impairments may have more difficulty in locating themselves using visual or auditory cues, uh, which we all use for our orientation. They seem to experience higher level of disorientation and distress, which, according to several, it can lead to agitation, aggression, and increased prevalence of hallucinations and delusions. Uh, people living with comorbid cognitive and sensory problems seem to be more isolated from family interactions, they seem to participate less in social activities and hobbies, and often are marginalized in, within their community, which can lead to depression and more rapid decline in function. Now, data coming from a Norwegian study, Tromso study, um, observed that hearing loss is associated with anxiety symptoms and that dual sensory loss is resulting in increased depressive symptomatology. 
It is also worth mentioning that studies reported an association between sensory impairment and cognitive decline. Um, just as a note, a uh, study from Linnet colleagues of 2011, uh, using data from longitudinal study of aging cohort, resulted that the severity of baseline hearing loss was associated with an increased risk of all-cause dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Whereas uh, a study coming from Dillard colleagues in uh, 2017 um, with respondent aged at about 70 and 79 years old uh, resulted that those who reported moderate or severe hearing impairment were at an increased risk of a 9-year incident dementia. Uh, again, some graphs from uh, the SER study, Survey of Health, Aging and Retirement in Europe, and an ELSA study, English Longitudinal Survey of Aging, um, they found that respondents with poor hearing function had lower cognitive function than those with good hearing function. Um, at uh, Livingstone's and colleagues at 2017, mentioned hearing loss as a potentially modifiable risk factor. They developed a life course model of dementia risk factors where above, amongst others, they estimated that about 9% of dementia cases were attributable to hearing loss during midlife. Apart from hearing loss, also depression and social isolation, which we have just mentioned, was um, considered also as modifiable risk factors. Despite the high prevalence and the association that a few surveys have seen between sensory impairment and cognitive impairment, still hearing loss is underreported and under-treated among older adults. Uh, to be more precise, in the United States, over 20 million older adults had untreated hearing loss. While there is a lack in appropriate detection and management of sensory impairments in up to 94% of people with dementia. Um, while hearing aids could be of use, surveys found that only one in seven, approximately, with hearing loss are using a hearing aid. To address these unmet needs, in 2016, uh, a research program was funded by Horizon 2020, entitled Ears, Eyes and Mind, the SenseCog project to improve mental well-being for elderly Europeans with sensory impairment. Um, this project has participants from nine countries, 17 participants, one of those is the University of Athens, with, uh, for which the principal investigator is Professor Politis. The SenseCog project aims at understanding the interrelationship between sensory and cognitive impairment, at identifying novel means of screening and detection for diagnostics and therapeutic purposes, and at translating this knowledge into clinical application for the mental well-being. For this purpose, uh, this program has six um, work packages uh, worth mentioning is that the leader of the program is University of Manchester um, with uh, Professor Leroy uh, and Pierce Dobbs. Uh, this program has six work packages. The first one is about understanding the links between cognitive and hearing impairment. The second work package named assessment um, is focusing on improving the early detection and diagnosis of sensory, cognitive and emotional problems in older adults uh, while adapting some assessments and e-health check tools. The work package number three uh, about intervention is a randomized control trial uh, focusing on determining the effectiveness of a newly complex developed sensory intervention in improving quality of life for both participants and their companions. Uh, the evaluation work package is focused on um, evaluating the economic impact of sensory impairment on mental health, while the innovative work package five 
um, is focusing on raising awareness and communicate the message of the importance of sensory health for future mental health. In this project, um, in several countries, uh, groups, public voice and patient groups were formed. And of course, there is also a work package for the ensurement of timely delivery results and ethic conduct of the research. Now about our study, uh, we will have the chance to present some preliminary data uh, concerning regarding the neuropsychiatric symptomatology in people with dementia and sensory deficits. Um, before going into details, um, a bit of a background information about neuropsychiatric symptomatology. It occurs in all types of dementia, it is universal and is affecting almost 98% of individuals at some point in the disease course. Uh, it, um, it is costly. 30% uh, of the cost of caring for community dwelling people with dementia is attributable to NPS management, to neuropsychiatric symptomatology management. And those symptoms are, always, are often associated with poor health outcomes in pa participants living with dementia, in increased healthcare utilization, earlier nursing home placement, um, increased morbidity, mortality, hospitalization, and it is also um, increasing the stress, burden and depression on caregivers. If untreated, this neuropsychiatric symptomatology um, seems to be associated with more rapid disease progression than if it is absent. Uh, on the other hand, effective treatment of uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms may have the potential to modify disease course, to lower health costs and to improve quality of life for both people living with dementia and their caregivers. Uh, when it comes to dementia, uh, symptoms such as depression, agitation and apathy seems to be associated with it and are highly prevalent in community settings. Uh, in uh, research by Professor Likechos and colleagues on 2000, uh, a sample, at a sample of 1,002 participants, depression, agitation and apathy were common in participants with dementia and almost 61% uh, exhibited one or more mental or behavior disturbances in the past month. Uh, but neuropsychiatric symptomatology is also common among individuals with mild neurocognitive impairment. Uh, its prevalence is estimated to range between 35 and 85 percent and has also been associated with worse cognitive performance and functional disability. Uh, a figure coming from a cross-sectional study of Okura and colleagues of 2010 shows us the estimated prevalence of individuals' neuropsychiatric symptoms according to cognitive category. Um, using some data from um, the Aging Demographics and Memory study. Uh, at this study, at a sample of eight, 856 adults, depression was observed to be the most common individual symptom in these categories, uh, whereas apathy and agitation were more prevalent in the severe uh, dementia category. On the other hand, it was uh, observed that symptoms such as delusion, um, depression and anxiety were less frequent in severe um, dementia than the group of moderate dementia. Now, about the neuropsychiatric symptomatology in the presence of sensory deficits, only a few studies have examined their relationship so far. Um, most of these studies were small case studies, uh, used non-validated measures uh, for neuropsychiatric symptomatology and relied upon either self-report hearing loss, subjective hearing loss. Um, the research of Kim and colleagues at 2020 is not one of them and we will present it later on. Before going into our preliminary results, uh, just to repeat the aim of this study, 
uh, we aimed to investigate the association between hearing deficits and neuropsychiatric symptoms in older adults with neurocognitive disorder. Our sample consists of 125 participants, followed by their companion. All participants fulfilled the DSM-5 criteria for neurocognitive disorder. Uh, vascular dementia and prototemporal dementia was excluded. Now, from this sample, 70 participants had no hearing impairment, coming from the psychogeriatric outpatient clinic of the University General Hospital of Patras and 55 participants had hearing impairment and coming from the psychogeriatric outpatient clinic of the University of Athens. Material used in this study, uh, of course, some demographics uh, variables. Uh, we had the assessment with the MOCA cognitive assessment. Uh, assessing for hearing impairment, we used the hear check device. Uh, we will uh, talk about it a bit and for the neuropsychiatric symptomatology we used the neuropsychiatric inventory um, namely uh, we multiply in this study the frequency and severity of 12 uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms as uh, uh, we can see in this slide and later on about the hearing assessment um, we used the hear check device to define the presence of hearing impairment. Uh, this device tests the sequence with three signals at 1000 Hz and 3000 Hz and the hearing impairment was defined by bilateral hearing difficulty indicated by failure of a pure tone at each ear. Um, you can see in this slide the graph of uh, inclusion and exclusion. The ones that um, had zero and zero tones at right or left ear were excluded and so were the ones that uh, heard six tones per each ear. Um, although the sample of non-hearing impaired did not, was not assessed via the hear check device, they uh, were uh, assessed via um, the, their hearing um, function was self-reported uh, followed by uh, the companion self-report and also the observation in the clinical examination. About the statistical analysis, uh, we used descriptive statistics and normal distribution assessment and due to um, the fact that the data were not normally distributed in the inferential statistics, we used correlation test, chi-square and Mann-Whitney test. Now about the results, some demographics about the participants. Uh, in the non-hearing impaired group, the average age of participants was 75, with average approximately 8 years of education, and total MOCA score at approximately 17 out of 30 and the majority of them were females, 61.4%. Uh, while at the hearing impaired group, the average age was 80 years old with 10 years of education and total MOCA score at about 15 out of 30. Uh, again, the majority of the participants were females. Uh, all variables such as age, education and MOCA score were found to be statistically significant. Uh, again, some demographics about the marital status and the living status. For the no hearing impaired group, uh, the majority of them were married, uh, living with family or with spouse. Whereas at the hearing impairment group, um, the participants were for 43.6% married and 49.1% widowed and majority of them were living with spouse or living alone. About the companion, uh, for the no hearing impairment group, uh, average age of companions were at 57 years old with uh, 12 years of education approximately 
uh, again majority were female uh, married uh, and at the hearing impaired group average age of companions were 58 years old with average two years of education at 14 years majority of companions were females at this group as well and married Uh, excuse me, at the previous slide, also the education of the companion was found to be statistically significant. Now about MOCA results. Uh, we've already mentioned that uh, there was statistically significance on the MOCA total score, but at the same time uh, we found statistically significant some items of MOCA, namely serial 7, sentence repetition, abstraction and orientation. In here we can see the mean ranks as well. At sentence repetition, mocha abstraction, orientation and total mocha, the impaired group scored less than the non-impaired group. When it comes to NPI, all 12 items of the NPI questionnaire uh, were analyzed. Uh, from these, the ones that was, were found statistically significant were anxiety, disinhibition, and appetite changes. From these, uh, when, compared, when compar comparing the means, um, from anxiety, disinhibition, and appetite changes, only the item of disinhibition was scored more by the hearing impaired group. And here we can also see the standard deviation apart from the mean uh, number. So disinhibition is the one that was scored more in the hearing impaired group. And in case it is helpful, a slide with a standard deviation for all items of the NPI for all 12 symptoms included in the NPI questionnaire. Now, from the studies that already exist, the study from Kim and colleagues at 2020 uh, seemed to use um, valid audiometric testing of pure tone. It is a cross-sectional study that is assessing the number of uh, neuropsychiatric symptomatology, the severity of these symptoms, and depressive symptom severity in relationship to hearing status, using a sample of uh, 101 older adults with varying cognitive impairment at a care memory clinic. They used the NPIQ and the Cornell scale for depression in dementia for assessment. Um, they observed that participants with hearing loss had significantly increased number of neuropsychiatric symptomatology and for every 10 decibel increase in hearing loss severity uh, they, there was a 1.3 point increase in total neuropsychiatric symptomatology severity and 1.5 point increase in depressive symptom severity. Uh, now they also mentioned in the study that hearing aid users experienced fewer uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms, less severe, and fewer severe depressive symptoms. Um, moreover, the hearing aid users report, reported a nearly four point lower total NPS and a three point lower total uh, CSTT score than the no, no users of hearing aids. Another study from Keeley and uh, colleagues at 2018, uh, they investigated the differential association between sensory loss and neuropsychiatric symptomatology with and without diagnosed neurocognitive disorder. From this study, 13% of participants reported clinically relevant neuropsychiatric symptomatology and the ones diagnosed with a major neurocognitive disorder, from those, uh, those who reported any sensory loss had over three times greater rates of neuropsychiatric symptomatology. Uh, although in this study uh, for they um, tested for sensory impairment, but for hearing impairment 
uh, they used the self-report um, method. For our results, uh, patients with dementia and hearing impairment showed comparative number of most neuropsychiatric symptoms when compared with people with dementia with no hearing impairment. Uh, patients and um, participants uh, with dementia and hearing impairment showed significantly less anxiety, less appetite changes and more disinhibition. Uh, limitations of the study uh, is the sample, the number in total, uh, although the data is preliminary, and the self-reported no hearing impairment for the group of the no hearing impaired. Uh, in order to better understand the potential role of hearing loss in dementia and in neuropsychiatric symptomatology, there is a need for more studies, methodologically sound, in order to understand the pattern of ontology in people with neurocognitive disorder and hearing impairment, there is a need for an early detection of hearing impairment, uh, either by testing the hearing impairment at uh, daily practice, and a need for assessment, for adjusted assessment, um, providing appropriate neurocognitive instruments adjusted for hearing impairment when needed. Uh, in um, the psychogeriatric department in the University of Athens, uh, we have the license to use the MOCA hearing. Uh, it's an adjusted version of MOCA for hearing impairment, which is also which is also validated uh, is on the uh, validation procedure at the moment. Uh, some references from today's presentation. And I would also like to thank uh, the colleagues working in the study and uh, special thanks to professors Politis and Alexopoulos for their guidance and support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kodogiani, for this uh, very interesting data regarding the, a new field in neuropsychiatric symptoms and in patients with neurocognitive disorder. And uh, please, if you have to, uh, we want to hear your comments and your questions regarding our work. Thank you very much. Well, Adoni, if it's okay, I could start. Uh, this is wonderful work, a very important direction. Uh, I have lots and lots of questions. This is an area we think a whole lot about here, both in terms of how hearing impairment might or might not be a true risk factor of dementia as opposed to an indicator of, of dementia uh, that's impending. Um, but in the context of neuropsychiatric symptoms, a couple of thoughts. One is, what is your thought about the specificity? In other words, the association between hearing loss and psychopathology, is that specific to dementia or uh, could that possibly somehow linked in people who are older but don't have dementia? And then the other question is, what do you think is the mechanism here? How would you mechanistically pull together hearing loss and neuropsychiatric symptoms in dementia or in other settings? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, it's still under investigation. Um, during the SenseCoke project, um, especially at the Work Package 1, when it's, uh, where they investigate the um, interlink between cognitive and sensory impairment, uh, quite a few studies mentioned the association between cognitive decline and sensory impairment, especially hearing and vision impairment. Uh, not enough studies were uh, focusing on neuropsychiatric symptomatology. Uh, an interesting part, uh, in my observation, coming from um, the intervention work package is that the function ability of the participants is assessed and uh, it's assessed in 
all categories of uh, vision, hearing and cognitive um, abilities. For example, if someone um, has difficulty in using the phone, it is assessed whether they don't know how to use the phone or they do not use the phone because they do not hear the respondent in the phone or because they cannot see the right buttons in the phone in order to use it. And in my opinion, this is a quite interesting um, thing to notice when the project is over, to see whether or, or which area is, I don't know the word, but which area is um, the, the one that relates with the functional disability of the participant. But I'm not sure if I replied correctly to your question about the first part, Professor. Well, let me follow up a, a little bit. So uh, are, would you be surprised uh, if you saw a patient who was 88 years old, who was very hearing impaired, who had no dementia and had auditory hallucinations? Yes, we have cases like this. Uh, I, I can follow your your thinking. The field is quite new. Um, uh, it, it seems we, we don't know if uh, if let's say patients with hearing loss and without dementia have uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms. There is a, a several publications regarding this, but uh, we don't know if. Uh, uh, if we have patients with dementia and neuropsychiatric symptoms, it's, it's, it's important to understand if this neuropsychiatric symptoms is different from patients with dementia and not hearing deficits. And, and I, to my opinion, this new field uh, creates uh, new questions about the comorbidity of, of, of patients with dementia and the, the presence of, uh, of different symptoms due to probably the comorbidity. And I think the sense code at the end of the project could respond in, in several of the questions you, you, you mentioned, uh, Costas. So, so can I ask? Yes. So, so your sense, I think, you know, it's really a conundrum and it's very hard to know the direction. So, it's actually really a follow-up to what Costas asked because there have been studies on that, even a big study from NAC uh, relating, you know, the hearing loss with neuropathology, how deficits more than anything. So, so do you feel that something? Do you think? Do you feel that beyond the the sensory neural de uh, acoustic deficit that we have with because of aging, do you think that Alzheimer's pathology? amyloid or tau contribute to more hearing deficit or vice versa. I mean, I'm what's your overall impression from the literature or is it vice versa that people, um, because of the deprivation, because of the sensory deprivation, they become cognitively worse within a cognitive reserve framework. Uh, um, I'm going a little bit away from the uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms, which I guess is the direct focus of what you're looking into. But it's like the elephant in the room. Do you think both happen or do you think it's more one or the other? Okay, uh, uh, there is a great interest about the, the, this, um, um, your question, Nikos. And uh, I, I read the paper, last paper indicates that probably a hearing deficits could contribute to uh, to, degener to the de degeneration process. Um, uh, from the moment that the field is open, uh, so we have more data that probably hearing deficits could uh, contribute to, to, to the de degeneration process. But uh, I, I cannot, uh, I'm not so, uh, to conclude with, uh, to be so sure that uh, this happened really to any patient we have. 
Maybe I missed the beginning of the part. Are there any treatment interventions with these participants? If there are treatment like amelioration of their uh, yes. In the project, I think Evangelia is running the, the intervention in this group of patients, and um, we don't have the results actually because the, the, the project is still running, and uh, we, we will have the results in the next few months about the results of the intervention. The intervention is, uh, I think, Evangelia, you could say more on this issue. Um, first of all, to begin with, about the sensory deprivation, the prevention, about the stimuli. Um, it is also observed in the study that where, whenever there is hearing deficit, um, they, the participants often are marginalized or um, denying to uh, take part at hobbies or at outdoor activities. And when it comes to the intervention, um, apart from the whole assessment and then the clear assessment of uh, audiology or visual assessment, uh, depending on the um, impairment. Um, there are some uh, visits regarding the sensory support about the right use of the hearing aid or uh, the uh, case of uh, vision impairment, the right glasses. For example, after assessment, the participants that are um, randomized in the intervention group they're having fully assessment uh, for their impairments and they are given um, sensory equipment, either hearing aids or glasses or both. At the same time, the sensory intervention cons consists of supporting the participants in the right use of the aid. For example, in the literature it said that only a few of the participants with hearing loss are actually using a hearing aid or if they have a hearing aid, they're not using it often. So at the sensory intervention, we have the component of uh, supporting them for the right use of the hearing aid, goal setting on in which activities they can wear the hearing aid better and in time, um, <coughs> the social engagement activities, like fostering the social environment, uh, correcting the communication between the companion and the participant. Now, the word correcting is not the appropriate one, but um, boosting the right communication with the participant and the companion. Um, uh, we are doing a function assessment, uh, trying to check in which areas on functional disability are uh, associated with cognitive or visual or hearing impairment, for example, the telephone use. And at the same time, um, there is also an element of referral to community services for the time that the intervention is over so that they know, and not only, of course, uh, so that they know in which areas or in which um, services uh, they can go to for better social engagement as well, uh, in cases when this is possible, of course. What's the control condition? The control condition excuse me, is um, that after the assessment, they are randomized into the carer's usual group, and there's only telephone calls at... Uh, two times between the 18th week of assessment and the 36th week of assessment. But telephone calls are also used at the sensory intervention group. So there is no assessment about okay, so, their impairment. Right. So I'm asking also because of the, of the Greek uh, finger study that we were thinking about. Because I'm trying to think, and you know, maybe Panos and Kostas can understand, trying to think uh, what we will be doing in case we find some participants with sensory deprivation, whether we would just refer them to some ENT or some ophthalmologist that we can connect to, or whether it's optimal to have a more multi-level intervention like the one you described, although we don't know whether it's effective yet or not, uh, and it's a little bit more complex. 
So, you know, it's kind of something to think about. So we will see what will be the outcome, right? May I ask a question? Okay. Many thanks, Evangelia, for this very interesting uh, talk. I would like uh, to ask for your comment on uh, the significant differences uh, you have observed. I, I think that uh, you have expected that uh, individuals with uh, hearing uh, difficulties, that they would have uh, suffered from more severe or from more neuropsychiatric symptoms, but actually what uh, you uh, detected is that, uh, in the, that the individuals with uh, the hearing difficulties had actually less anxiety symptoms and less uh, problems with uh, appetite changes. Indeed. How could we interpret such, such a finding? Um, apart from that, and thank you for your question, uh, is that it, they also um, there was also significant um, a statistically significant between the disinhibition, which is um, a symptom that um, we haven't seen so far at the existing bibliography. Although again, studies are few um, on this field, and the sample is uh, small since it's preliminary data. Um, to me, it is difficult to explain the findings so far, but um, I am wondering actually if this stimuli deprivation somehow has a protective function against the development of anxiety symptoms. Less stimuli, less anxiety symptoms. I don't know. It, it is just an interpretation. That is an interesting uh, comment. Thank you. Um, it would be just an interpretation by my side or just a hypothesis so far. Uh, we haven't seen some result that could actually uh, justify that at this point. Um, but further research is needed because it's, it's a pattern um that may differ from uh, participants that have no hearing impairment but that's upon further research studies Thank it, you. it will be interesting if we have all the data from all the countries to to to, to, to see what happened and uh, however for for me it's it was very surprising to have the disinhibition as a, a, a major component of this uh, neuropsychiatric uh, symptoms and uh, it, it might be due to the impact of uh, the auditory uh, uh, loss to the executive dysfunction, it, it might be. But uh, we have to, to see all the, the countries that participate in this uh, project to, to, to put together the data and uh, to, to see the final result. However, I think this comparison was very interesting, uh, Panos. And thank you for your support in this uh, research because uh, I, it's the first uh, work that uh, try to check or to compare two different groups. And uh, uh, it, it's, it is very interesting to see these different parts of neuropsychiatric symptoms. And uh, we have to take care of when this patient coming to our outpatient clinic because it seems to, to be apathetic, but uh, it, it, it seems that apathy is not. Uh, uh, so important uh, uh, between the two groups. It's less anxiety. And we have to, to discuss, and to, to recheck and uh, our uh, hypothesis on why we have these uh, uh, neuropsychic symptoms.
uh, another issue that we, we don't have any other uh, questions, and uh, we are thinking in our outpatient clinic, we continue even after the, the, the uh, after concluding this uh, project to evaluate patients uh, with uh, sensory deficits, and uh, we, we we have all the procedure uh, to follow in the future with uh, our patients uh, coming here and having uh, sensory deficits. So this is a project that will continue to, to work on it. And uh, it's, it's something new for uh, my group. And uh, thanks, Evangelia, uh, that became an expert in this field and uh, is running uh, this project. Thank you, Evangelia, for your uh, support and for your working hard in this uh, study. Evangelia, maybe we will contact you from the Greek finger team to get a little bit more details on the intervention to discuss it a little bit with the group. I don't miss okay, I hope, okay? Evangelia, also, you have to know that Evangelia is working now in the university with uh, the Orila uh, okay. group in the University okay. of Athens. And uh, she is working also in uh, non pharmaceutical interventions with uh, Healing and West. Huh? Okay. So he's an expert in the field now. <laughs> Vagilia, I will send you my email if you can send it back so that we'll be in contact, okay? Okay, thank you very much. I send it in the chat, okay. <laughs> so if you don't have any other questions, uh, we can conclude this. Uh, uh, Meeting. Thank you all for your uh, support, for your presence, for your questions in a very difficult issue. Eh? We are not an ex we are not expert in this, and uh, however, we we have a new a new research uh, fellow that is working on this field in, in Greece, and this is very very important. That could contribute in all the other research projects that we are running, uh, Nikos and uh, Panos and uh, other colleagues in in, in Greece. Thank you very much, all of you. My greetings in the United States. Kostas, Vaso, Nikos, thanks. Panos, thanks for your uh, supporting. And uh, let's move ahead in, in the next project. Good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Well done. Thank you. Yeah.